Electric bikes are all the rage these days. In fact, I just recently bought one myself, and now I understand why it's all the craze. It's a, it's a lot of fun. But I'm also interested in how e-bikes fit into e-mobility and how they fit into public policy. So I was very interested when I came across a paper uh, by a couple of economists. Uh, Harrison Hong is one of them, and I'll be talking to him about uh, the effects of uh, subsidies on e-bike adoption in Sweden. So welcome to the interview, Harrison. Thanks, Marco. Happy to be here. Well, why don't we start with an overview of your paper, please? Sure. So um, our paper is uh, studying uh, this, this uh, major uh, subsidy program for e-bikes in Sweden um, that um, spent about uh, $425 million uh, subsidizing e-bikes for a year. And we were interested in studying uh, kind of the impact of these subsidies, uh, particularly uh, in terms of comparing the cost of the subsidies to how much uh, uh, carbon emissions did they actually reduce. Uh, and it turns out kind of calculating, uh, making this calculation um, is, is, is typically very difficult uh, because you need to sort of first know uh, for, for every dollar of subsidy that you give a consumer, uh, how much of it goes to the consumer and how much of it actually went to a producer because they could charge kind of higher prices. Uh, second, a lot of consumers um, might have bought the e-bike anyways, right? So, so you know, they, they, you know, they didn't, they, all, all you did by giving a program was that they just kind of, you know, they took advantage of it, uh, but they might, they might have bought it like a year later, right? And then kind of the third part, of course, is you need to sort of measure uh, whether or not they actually stopped driving, right? Did they use the e-bike? Was the e-bike a substitute for just kind of like not biking? Uh, or was it a substitute for... Uh, their car use, which is obviously what the Swedish government had hoped, right? And and so kind of doing the calculation requires that we kind of make, you know, three separate calculations. And kind of the bottom line is that uh, uh, for every dollar of subsidy, all of it went to the consumer because the the the, uh, the e-bike uh, is a very competitive market. Uh, second, uh, about 60% of of the people who got e-bikes uh, responded in a survey that it was pretty critical for their uh, uh, decision to ultimately adopt the e-bike. So that means about 30% really didn't need it. They would have bought the e-bike anyways. Uh, and then we were able to also track down their driving habits. And you know there was a, a reduction uh, in terms of car use. So there was not a substitution away from other means of transportation, but primarily there was a substitution away from, 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 from car use. And kind of when we put all the calculations together, you know, uh, a typical person in the program got about a $500 subsidy. Uh, so there was kind of a maximum of $1,000 you could get for your food and back. So the typical household got a $500 subsidy. And we calculated that based on their uh, reduced emissions, um, you know, you could justify the program if you thought that the social cost of carbon was uh, on the order of like several hundred dollars, uh, which is you know significantly higher than what let's say the U.S. EPA is saying the cost of carbon is. Okay, so the you found that uh, uh, recipients averaged about eleven hundred and forty six. Uh, 1146 kilometers per year. That's the 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 kilometers they didn't drive in their car. Right. And which I would imagine, you know, if you're in a more rural area or small city is not a big deal. But in a in a big urban center would be a, a significant amount. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. So um, this is um, what we found was that the adoption of e-bikes uh, was kind of scattered throughout Sweden. Uh, it was not, you know, some of it came from the rural areas, uh, but a lot of it also came from kind of more urban areas. Uh, and, and that, you know, there, there could have been some benefits also associated with uh, congestion. So, so that, you know, the only benefit might not have just simply been foregone carbon emissions, which is what the Swedish government cared about, uh, but potentially some other incidental benefits, uh, such as, you know, uh, less traffic in, uh, in and around the city. Right, we'll get into that in just a moment. Um, you found that each e-bike reduces lifetime carbon emissions by 1.3 tons. And you and so you mentioned that the um, uh, the uh, cost per ton of carbon abated was several hundred dollars. It, was it? I saw a number of six hundred dollars. Uh, is that too high, or maybe you could clarify that for us? Yeah. So 
what we did was we calculated a break even value for the cost of carbon that would make uh, the program basically pay off, right? So, so you know, the program is going to spend about four hundred dollars uh, uh, per per bike, and you know, there's going to be some foregone emissions of about like a ton, and so then. Now, not everybody who adopted, though, on the other hand, right, needed the subsidy. So you have to kind of factor that in, right? So, so ultimately, uh, you know, as far as the government spending, they were spending more on the order of seven hundred dollars or so, right, for 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 the adoption of the e-bike, and in, and in exchange, they had reductions of around like 1.1, 1.2 tons of emissions per year uh, over the lifetime of uh, over the lifetime of of the bike, uh, and you would need then roughly around six hundred dollars of for the cost of emissions to kind of for that to balance out, right? You know, for the seven hundred sixty dollar subsidy to balance out with how much emissions you were kind of foregoing. That number is just our break even number. Okay, so so you know nobody really knows what is the true cost of carbon uh, that we face right now. Right, uh, various governments set different numbers. You know, the U.S. sets around like hundred dollars right now, so so you know, uh, it's fairly expensive uh, uh, program. Right now, uh, I came to your paper through a blog that was written by economist Lucas Davis, uh, who was at the Energy Institute at Haas University of, B of Berkeley. He wrote a, a blog post about your your paper, and and he, he, so the way he framed it is six hundred dollars or whatever the cost of uh, uh, per ton of carbon abated is expensive, uh, but there are all sorts of knock-on effects that then add value to that and actually, in his opinion, uh, perhaps justified the, the, the subsidy. Uh, now, if you were a, I, I know that I've interviewed many economists who would argue that the cost was too high, but I, what's your take on this the debate between you know the additional value added by the knock-on effects versus a true just you know, let the carbon price sort it all out. Yeah, no, we're 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 trying to work on uh, these extra benefits. I mean, it's true that um, many uh, environmental and public uh, finance economists view that uh, programs geared toward addressing climate change have a lot of other e-mobility, other kind of benefits associated with, 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 with these dollars. And we're trying to track that out. So, so we have the data to do this. Uh, so we're trying to get it now, but we don't have the answer right now in the paper. So we're trying to get congestion data. We're trying to get some uh, health data on, on, on the uh, program participants. Lucas in his blog listed a bunch of uh, uh, incidental benefits associated with these programs. And so I think in subsequent drafts, we're gonna try to tab up uh, some of these other benefits as well. Um, but my, my inclination, just from kind of a, a quick look at the data, is that, you know, it would obviously help justify uh, the cost of these programs more. Um, but, but my general sense is that uh, these programs would do better if you were kind of targeting the subsidies better. That, that, you know, in other words, you can quite easily justify these programs if you kind of had a, a better screening mechanism, right? You know, uh, so, so for instance, you know, in Sweden, everybody could kind of get the program, but, but if you had, for instance, uh, some type of an income uh, uh, threshold, right? That would help a lot because a lot of the people who reported that they don't really need the subsidy tended to be, uh, 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 you know, a higher income uh, in, the, in, the, in, in, in the Swedish population. Right. One of the reasons I was interested in your paper, Harrison, is because I've been arguing for a while now that electric mobility gives us so many more options for our own personal mobility, uh, our model, if you will. You know, we can have e-bikes and scooters and electric vehicles and soon robo taxis and automated shuttles and all sorts of things. It allows us to get it will allow us to get around more efficiently, probably more at a lower cost. Mm -hmm. And I see e-bikes fitting into that. And uh, Lucas didn't mention this in his in his blog post, but that seems to me that might be a significant knock on benefit uh, of these kinds of subsidies is that you're helping people to rearrange to rethink their how they how they, uh, you know, get from point A to point B in a more efficient, less polluting fashion. Yeah, no, you're, you're totally right. Uh, one of the um, one of the ways that 
we think this sort of happens is what we call kind of pure effects, right? That, you know, let's say uh, somebody gets the subsidy and they adopt, right, in an area. Uh, that may have some spillovers in terms of the adoption by their friends, right? Who may uh, otherwise have been on the margin not wanting to adopt, but now they're basically saying, oh, wow, you know, uh, this could be kind of useful. So that's kind of related to, to, to your uh, a general e-mobility point that there could be kind of knock-on effects to the adoption of other types of e-products, right? You know, uh, whether it's like kind of electric cars, it's just like uh, a reshaping of the entire transportation structure. And, and I, I agree with that. I, I think we're, we're trying to get a handle on that by seeing to what extent a lot of the adoptions were clustered uh, in certain areas subsequent. So we also can track e-bikes uh, after these programs. So we can see what happens, you know, for the areas that got a lot of e-bike subsidies, right? Do you see then kind of a more of a, a change uh, in terms of the adoption of future e-bikes by other people in that area as well? Uh, but, but you know, I, I completely agree that this, this, our calculations don't take into account basically these knock-on effects for, for e-mobility generally. Great. Well, uh, Harrison, thank you very much for this. Uh, very interesting paper, and thank you for your insights. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me.